John, the, the current uh, global situation is obviously very uncertain and uh, you know, there is this kind of historic pattern that Labor governments tend to deal with um, things like depressions and recessions and global financial crises. Uh, is that where we're headed, do you think? Well, uh, a couple of points. I mean, I've been analysing and, and predicting economies since the late 60s and I think the risks today, the unpredictability today is greater than any time I can remember and we've had some pretty big shocks through that period, whether they were oil price shocks or recessions or stock market corrections or Asian crises or whatever, we've had big, big shocks and um, I think the risks though are much greater than, than I can remember. And uh, last weekend the um, yield curve, as they say in the US, inverted, you know, short rates went above long rates, which in using uh, Federal Reserve data suggests that there will be a recession in the United States within three to 24 months. So I think the US is slowing down, Europe is definitely struggling and slowing down, China's slowing down. Uh, and on top of that, you've got Trump, yeah. you know, yeah. which is the main source of volatility in the system and unpredictability. You've got... Uh, and China, the whole issue of... China's uh, debt uh, problem, you know, 300% yeah. of GDP, a lot of structural issues. Their growth rate's a lot lower than probably four or five percent rather than six or seven, which the government keeps announcing, but it's not a real number. Um, and, um, you know, so if, the, if global growth slows uh, and uh, we have some of the, the weaknesses in the system come to the fore, particularly the overvaluation of the stock markets, bond markets, you know, currency markets, property markets in different stages but different countries, I mean, they're all bubbles and they'll all burst. So you could have another global financial crisis. Uh, and the cupboard's in the near a bit, term. yeah. The cupboard's a bit bare, you know, as far as the Australian government goes for dealing with this. I mean, yeah. interest rates don't give you much scope these days, do they? They don't uh, have much capacity because you know the, the Reserve Bank's got the interest rate. Well, haven't changed it since well, I think August 2016. But uh, and I've been saying all through that period that they'll probably the next change of any would be down, yeah. and I think they might put it down. But you're in a world where when it's as low as it is. It's not going to make much difference. People aren't going to rush out and spend or invest. So you're not going to get much effect from lowering interest rates, even you know, 50 basis points or so. Um, and um, the fiscal position, although the government will announce a surplus and they'll say how clever they've been and they're back in surplus and they'll probably predict four years of surpluses. Uh, the truth is that they've all, both sides of politics, have made very large expenditure commitments that carry through the 2020s and beyond. Um, obviously, education, health commitments are significant. They are moving into the 2020s big numbers. Uh, you've got the Na N NDIS, which is uh, the Disability Insurance Scheme, which is, you know, I think they've predicted a 600% increase through to the end of this decade in the, the costs of running that, yeah. and uh, that's going to blow out. And um, then you've got a whole host of infrastructure commitments, and you get a lot more in this budget that are unfunded. And you've got hundreds of billions of dollars of defence commitments that, you know, submarines, frigates, air, fighter planes, yeah. you know, they're all unfunded and they're big numbers. So if you look, look around the, the literature, there's a book recently been published by uh, Mike Keating, who used to be Secretary of the, of the Department of Finance, I think, and Prime Minister and Cabinet. And he's predicting sort of a three percentage point uh, increase relative to GDP in the tax burden over the 2020s. Now, I don't hear anything about that. And of course, uh, yeah. We'll hear more tax cuts, and you know, mine's bigger than yours. Mm, yeah. None of them are affordable. And the revenue stuff's kind of, or the revenue projections are kind of fictional, aren't they? I mean, it's based on sort of uh, projections of commodity prices that, that right. probably won't hold up. And, and I mean, we're still dealing with, you know, Treasury forecasts about growth that, that really don't reflect any... Oh, Treasury's reality, been, though. the one thing they've yeah. been consistent about is being consistently wrong yeah. in their forecasts, and very ambitious in some of those numbers. Yeah particularly a turnaround say in wages, which is supposed to give you the big bracket creep base of the system. They have underestimated some of the commodity prices in the last budget, so now they've come in higher. That gives them a revenue boost, but that's not sustainable, particularly if the world economy is slowing down. I mean, we might have seen better iron ore and coal prices, but they won't be sustained. So I think the budget will be scrutinised as to what numbers they actually pick going forward for the next several years. Uh, and, um, you know, so they don't the revenue looks better now than it has, uh, partly because of uh, forecasting errors of the past and partly because they've, had, they've picked up a bit of additional tax revenue from the corporate sector, some catch-up tax, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, some of the bigger companies where they hadn't paid much tax. But basically the corporate tax system has been working like a resource rent tax 
high, resource, high commodity prices, they've had a better return. But we also see evidence of how few of the big companies, you know, Exxon Mobil is, you know, I forget what it takes out of the system every year, but it's well over $30 billion, they don't pay any tax. Yeah. You know, and they're, they're those who are in the LNG sector aren't going to pay much tax for another decade or so. So the corporate, there's an issue as to whether the corporate tax base is really sustainable. And all this is coming on the back to of the Banking Royal Commission where there are real issues of, of trust, I suppose, and, and uncertainties about precisely what uh, a new government is going to do with the, the, the recommendations of that Royal Commission, which were quite modest uh, and in some ways conservative, but the findings of the Royal Commission were, of course, uh, incendiary in a lot of ways. So, I mean, that, that seems to me to be another uncertainty too. Yeah, see, they don't, what, that the, what neither side is doing is really admitting the, real, the economic realities. I mean, they're spinning it to favour their particular position. And um, the fact is that, uh, you know, the narrative, say, of the government doesn't match the lived experience of most Australians. I mean, most Australians are really struggling to meet the cost of living week in, week out. And that's housing or that's electricity and gas prices or it's medical insurance costs or childcare costs or whatever. All those elements, the big elements in a family's household budget, are rising much faster than the measured rate of inflation. Yeah. And people's wages have stayed flat. I mean, under 2% over the last several years. This is a big issue, isn't <coughs> so it? So it's a this big, very big issue. This wages so. thing. I mean, for those of us of a certain age, the idea of this being a problem, it's, right. it's, it's a bit bizarre really, but it is these days. And they, see yeah. that what the households have had to do is, is yeah. both run down their savings and run up their debts. Yeah. To show you how ridiculous some of the rhetoric of the government has been, uh, when the household savings rate fell to pre-GFC levels, yeah. uh, Frydenberg went out there and said, see that shows you how confident people are, you know, they're spending. Because if you look at the consumption numbers, they're not spending. Yeah, yeah. Look at the retail sales numbers, they're not, yeah. they're not spending. They're pretty, pretty flat. So basically, we've now got a record level of household debt. It's about 120% of GDP. It's nearly 200% of household disposable income. So households have had to run up their debt, yeah. run down their savings just yeah. to survive. And they're doing it, unlike in yeah. the early 2000s, they're doing it at a time when right. the value of their houses is stagnating. And their houses are falling, yeah. house prices yeah. are falling. So yeah. they're, wealth, they're getting a negative wealth effect. Mm. Now go to the Royal Commission, that showed basically that a significant percentage of the bank the lending books, the mortgage books of the big four banks, are, uh, are subprime. Mm. They knowingly lent people much more money than they could afford. And now the idea there is, of course, that you know they've got a bit of initial equity in the house. As the house price continues to go up, they get more equity and they can ultimately service that loan. And a lot of those loans are interest-only loans, but they fudge the, the household expenditure numbers, income numbers and expenditure numbers to, get, to give them a bigger loan. Then house prices fall, their equity falls, the pinch is real. I mean, so mortgage stress is becoming very significant as an issue, and it's only going to get worse. The banks themselves are exposed now because they've got subprime quality loans on their books. You know what a bank's like. They say, oh, you're not really meeting your covenants, you're not meeting your interest payments and so on. Well, you know, we, uh, we can't have a fixed interest, or sorry, interest only anymore. You've got to come to principal interest. That kills most people. But when your house price is falling, your equity is disappearing, your net position in your house can be negative. Yes. If you've bought near the peak yeah. and the house, is, house price has come off 10 or 15%, yeah, you're, you're, you're behind. That's and that's a significant percentage of people because we had really a substantial housing boom. Now, the government's done nothing about the cost of housing. And, you know, it took a couple of decades to create this problem where millennials can't afford to buy a house in Sydney and Melbourne. You're not going to fix it in under a decade or so. You're going to have to work on both supply and demand side. It's like electricity prices. We've had a couple of decades of climate wars scoring points on each other. Bottom line is electricity prices, gas prices gone through the roof. And people are still getting very large electricity bills, despite the government saying, I've got a big stick, and going to belt the power companies or whatever. Yeah. It's not making any difference. A couple of hot yeah. days and your average price goes up. Because yeah. you go, you know, you, you really are paying super high prices on, on peak days and this sort of thing. So, you know, there's a lot of, lot of misrepresentation in all that. Now, I think the average voter knows all that. It's one of the reasons why I think the, the standing of both major political parties has gone down. And even in the last two state elections, Victoria and New South Wales, and all those by-elections, the aggregate vote of Liberal and Labor went down because mm -hmm. people just, you know, jack of it. They've given up on, on, uh, on uh, the two major parties. So independents and minor parties are getting nearly 20% of the vote. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see independents emerge in the lower house. Now, <clears throat> you know, this is an interesting interesting situation where neither of them are being believed, neither side is really being believed 
And, uh, you know, although they don't expect an independent or a minor party to make that much difference to government, it's a way of registering a protest vote. Yeah, well, it was up about so around a quarter. Right it was around a quarter, I think, of uh, uh, just under a quarter at the last election That's right. in I mean, the lower house. And the other thing that I noticed the other day in the New South Wales state election is a very high percentage of pre-polls, yeah. nearly 20%. People have made up their mind. They don't want to hear the arguments. They don't want to listen, the don't want to, listen to the campaign. Yeah. That's all rubbish, you know. Yeah. I'll just, I've, already, I've already decided I'm going to vote. Yeah. I did man a polling booth last week and I found a very high percentage of people said, no, I don't want the paper, you know, just yeah. walked in and voted. So People have kind of made up their mind. They made up think, their mind yeah. that they've basically yeah. given up yeah. on both sides of politics. Yeah. And it's a choice for the vote of the lesser of two evils. Yeah. And then when they've made that choice, they've got to live with the evil of two lessers because <laughs> they don't have any policy positions, right? That are, that are really going to solve the problem. I'm interested, though. I mean, some of the, the most contentious sort of economic policy differences between the parties at the moment are very generational. They're, they're sort of about the one you mentioned before, housing affordability. The franking credits one is, you know, in many ways about retirees and, and, and uh, you know, who, who essentially provides revenue and who gets refunds and all the rest of it. Superannuation is another one. It seems to me there's a range of issues that really bear on the different experiences and opportunities of younger and older voters. And I'm wondering if this is the first campaign certainly in my living memory, um, where that's the case, where generational well, you know, differences you, matter. Basically, a lot of the policies add up to intergenerational theft. Yeah. You know, you kick the problem down the road, you leave it to the next generation to deal with, and it's going to be a lot harder for them to do with that, whether it's uh, the budget you know, needing to be repaired in the 2020s, as we've been saying, or climate change, for example. You don't want to meet your Paris commitments or you duck and weave around it and Actually, Paris is about half what it ought to be in terms of, you know, meeting a sensible 2050 emissions reduction target. That's a big legacy to push down to your kids. And it is. When you think about, yes, if, if the taxes are going to be going up in the 2020s, that's when, you know, current folks in their 20s and 30s are going to be going to higher tax well, just brackets. Just imagine if wages stay flat, yeah, yeah. unemployment starts to become an issue, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and cost of living still continues to go up, and then the tax burden goes up rather than yeah. down. You know, the, it's, it's sort of a multiple number of whammies on the average, average person. And the younger generation, those that are supporting the older generation, are really carrying quite a load. So, yeah, I, none of that amazingly features. I noticed a few years ago when Costello inter introduced the intergenerational report. I brought it down at budget time. The budget that he brought down didn't reflect one thing in that report. <laughs> there was no medium-term yeah. strategic thinking. And it's never been any different. Yeah, we know what's happening to population and what will go. Some of these are reasonably hard numbers in terms of the number of people, the, you know, the, the costs of uh, aged care, the shift to the older population, the age, age mix shift. And some of these things are well known, they're well documented. They don't factor them in. And as you're saying, by not dealing with it, they push the problem against the older Australians, for example, or against the younger Australians. And it's amazing to me that that doesn't feature more as an issue I mean, Howard gave a speech yesterday saying, you know, inequality doesn't exist in Australia. It's exaggerated. Well, you know, I'm not sure which planet he lives on, but it ain't this one, yeah. you know, because it is, really is an issue and people feel it. And, you know, when you know, ask a politician why you're in politics, they say, oh, you know, uh, to make a difference. What most people believe that to mean is they make a difference for themselves. They don't, try, you know, they're in there for the system. They're probably earning more money than they'd earn outside. They're not skilled for the jobs they get. And, um, you know, so in those circumstances, it's not surprising there's a loss of, a, a, a mounting loss of trust and belief in government. Do you think, I mean, one argument would say that uh, a change of government's not going to make an enormous difference. And I suppose one of the things you said before, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of some of these big economic policy mm. issues. So the housing affordability is an interesting one. Mm. I mean, how much would something like the negative gearing changes that Labor's advocating you know, what kind of difference is that likely to make? I mean, my, my uh, assumption would be not terribly much in the short term, given the... No, and it, it is just grandfather that's going to be phasing yes. over time. But and it's only, new, it's only on, on, uh, on old new, houses. Yeah, so, yeah, new, yeah, yeah. so they've constrained it yeah. quite a lot. So, yeah. um, but it, don't forget, it was introduced when housing prices were running away. Yeah. And there was a lot of foreign demand and speculative demand and so on in the system, which is making it harder and harder for the average Australian, a particularly younger Australian, to buy a house. Uh, now, of course, we have a situation where the market's turned, house prices are coming off, real mortgage stress, and OK, you make a negative gearing change, it probably won't have much impact. I suspect they might delay it, 
further grandfather it, you know, just phase it, whatever. The because time they, is not yet right. Well, they don't yeah, want to, yeah, yeah, they don't want to get hit. Yeah, don't yeah. want to get hit with the yeah. accusation that okay, the house prices are falling and you're going to kill it now, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, that exaggeration is there in the system already. Mm. So, yeah, some of their their policies. Uh, Look, from a the tax point of view, tax reform point of view, I don't like any of those small changes. While you can defend them as part of a broad review, I mean, go through all the tax expenditures, go through all the concessions that are in superannuation and housing and so on that are skewed in favour of the wealthy, mm. you know, and uh, yeah, sure, you would fix that as part of a general overarching reform. But if you're just doing bits ad hocly, you don't necessarily improve the situation and you actually make it more complicated and people want a simple tax system, you're making it much harder yeah. for the average person to understand their tax. So, and, and the effects are not necessarily what you assume they will be. Mm. And um, you know, so I think while they've taken some clear positions on a couple of elements, tax and you know, capital gains tax discount, uh, negative yeah. gearing, um, franking, yeah, franking credits, credits yeah. they're not necessarily now going to have the effects that they hoped they would have when they, when they announced them. Yeah. So I suspect when they get into government, they'll say, oh, you know, well, you know, didn't realise it was what it was and, uh, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll change it. And, but in some areas, they can make a big difference. If they really did adopt the idea that we need to make the transition to a low carbon society, low carbon economy, and accelerated that process, and that created all these jobs and billions of dollars of investment that are presently being lost, they could make a huge difference. And OK, they'll have to accelerate the retirement of coal-fired power stations, but 70% of the existing coal-fired power stations are already beyond their, yeah. you know, their, their design life. Mm. So, look, it, it's possible for them to do that, and that would make a huge difference, and we'd stop all this nonsense.